Welcome to Stagecoach, where you'll find the best Western books on the market and the men and women who write them. This podcast is brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, home of the best-selling authors in the Western genre. This is your host, Ginger Winters. Thank you for joining us as we read Honored Friend and Hero, written by Jeff Crawford, read by Cameron Buckner. Honored Friend and Hero, written by Jeff Crawford, read to you by Cameron Buckner. One, it came as a shock and it frightened him. He thought himself long past being frightened anew, but he'd been wrong. It was the sadness of the quiet that threatened to undo him. For two days there had been noise. Horrible, terrible, unrelenting noise, and then it was no longer pounding in his ears. It was still going on because he could feel the reverberation shaking in his body. With each blast, with each pop, his body jumped a little, but he no longer heard the dreadful noise. He briefly considered the possibility that he had gone deaf, but that wasn't the case. Little things like a branch snapping or a bird winging its way to perch in a tree that loomed above him still registered. But all the other was gone. No, not exactly gone. It was still there, but now it was as if it had been wrapped around and around with swaths of cotton and placed under water. It could be heard if you were listening specifically for it, but you really had to try to hear it now. He didn't want to try. He didn't want to hear it. He never wanted to hear those sounds again, but he knew that they were out there just beyond him, waiting. He would have thought that it would have been the screaming or the pleading or the crying that would have bothered him the most, but it wasn't. At some point, he had numbed to almost all of that, Never all of it. There was no way a person could set himself apart from all of that. Even when it wasn't going on beside and near, it would always be there. And he believed this. More than believed, he was certain of it. There was so much of it nearly all the time that it had soaked through his clothing into his skin and it kept going. The sounds of wailing and weeping was hard set into his bones now. He would never be able to distance himself from it. But it was the other that threatened to tear him from his frame. Constantly seemed as if it would separate his muscle and sinew until he fell completely apart, never to be rejoined. The sounds that had been the precursor and cause of all the screaming and wailing and weeping, that was what was still there. Only now, for a moment, it had been mercifully muffled for a time. What was the need for all the terrible sound, he asked himself, as he held hands cupped tightly over his ears. What was the need of any of it? Some part of him understood, or at least understood as much as he knew about it, had understood before, else he would have never come. The reasoning behind all of this awfulness had been just, but that had been before. Now... It just kept going long past the point where it should have had a halt called. Now it was all just senseless. Senseless, relentless, continuous, and he was right in the middle of it. He tried not to make mistakes. He had been brought up to try not to make mistakes. They had spent hour upon hour training him not to make mistakes. Everyone was going to, but the goal was to try not to. If you did that which they had taught you, then the number of mistakes would be significantly lessened. So he had done as he had been brought up, and he had done as he had been instructed, and it had worked since arriving. The mistake, however, had been in coming at all. Early on, before it all became real, he had been questioned. He was sure that his decision to do this thing wasn't a mistake. He had smiled back in a knowing sort of way and walked on. 
It had been a huge mistake, and he had realized that as soon as it all began in earnest. He wanted to go back, return to where he had been before all of this, admit that he had made the mistake and be safe where it was quiet. That was impossible. Some things can never be undone, and some mistakes can be apologized for, but you still have to live with and through them. He was sure that coming here was one of those tight mistakes, and as long as he lived, he would know that this was the biggest mistake he had ever made. But the problem was that by making the mistake, his time to live would undoubtedly be severely lessened. This was no way to live. On the contrary, it was good for nothing other than dying. He shuddered and tried to make himself smaller as the noises returned. They hadn't actually returned because they had never actually gone away. They were always there. Sometimes they were far away and sometimes they were right there beside you, but they were always somewhere. That was the problem with them. They were relentless and never ceasing. There was never a stopping, not even for a moment it seemed. Obviously, there were times when it was once again quiet, but the echoes of those sounds, the pounding, the sizzling, the horrendous thuds, the screams, they were all embedded into his memory and played over and over when the actual sounds were at rest for a moment. He looked over and the man beside him that he did not know was mouth wide open screaming in agony and terror, but no sound was there to be heard. He was not holding the pose until his breath could be caught so that he might start again. He was frozen that way for time eternal. His release from all of this horror had finally come, but it had come in the way that so many here feared. Everyone was afraid of going the way that man beside him had gone. All but the most insane were afraid to stay, just like he himself was afraid of staying. There was no in-between, no place in the middle to think and evaluate. There was only fear of staying and the fear of going. So many had gone since his arriving, and they had all gone badly. He took the man's water and he drank it greedily. His own had run out earlier, and the man had no further use for his. It was the way things were done in this place. It was another of the things that he had not been adequately prepared for when he was being adequately prepared. The fact that it was acceptable to steal the last morsels of food and the last drops of water from the dead and dying. He had seen those things being taken from the alive and not nearly dying, but he had not gone so far himself and he had passed no judgments on those that had. They had been here and at places just like here longer than he had. You could read the days and months in their eyes. You could read the months and seasons they had been here and at the places just like here in their gaunt frames. He had looked away when he had borne witness to these things, not because he was full of disgust, but because he wished to induce no further shame than what the looters must already be feeling. Ask him again in a month if he had acted as those he had watched had acted. He might tell you a different story. No. No, he wouldn't. He would not be here, nor would he be in another place just like here to ask such questions. He would either be gone or he would be dead. He was close to not caring which. He could not remain not in this place or another just like it. His mind and his nerves would betray him if he remained, and he could feel them trying to even now. That is why death would be considered a relief. He had not been raised to think of death in those terms, but neither had he been raised to ever expect himself to be in the position he now found himself. He had been raised to want to live at all costs, to squeeze every ounce of life from each day. Not to go running headlong to death so that death could find him without any bother, or he was to help someone across the way find death just that much sooner than he should have. That is what you do in this place, or another place just like this one. You die, 
or you insist that someone from across the way take your place on death's tally sheet. He could see no reason for either. That only left leaving, and he was afraid to do that. Almost as afraid of doing that as he was of dying, or seeing to it that someone did in his place. There were only three choices for him, and he feared all of them. Two of the choices were merely temporary, the other would mean a hardship of a very different nature. If he left, he would be alone. After being surrounded by so very many, he feared being alone. He thought about the quiet and how he would relish and treasure it, but it would come with a cost. It would be quiet where he wanted to go and it must remain so, else he would be brought back to this place or a place just like it. Quiet. Always quiet there. How long before that began to weigh on him and prey upon his fractured nerves the way that the sounds were doing now? Would he become accustomed to the quiet the way that he had not been able to do with the opposite of quiet? He didn't know. He could not hazard a guess, but he believed he must find out. There seemed to be no ending to all of this to be foreseen. He would not last. He would not endure. Not to the end if there ever was to be an end. Maybe not even until this time tomorrow. Nothing had ever seemed so wrong to him as this place. And the one that would come after it would be no better. He would understand it no clearer and adjust to it no better. He knew that much at least. He raised his head and looked around as much as he dared. It came as no surprise, but it was disheartening to see that all looked as it had the last time he had observed all around him. Some were running, some were hiding in earthen depressions as he was. Most were lying as they had fallen. A few were crawling or pulling themselves along, but most were lying very still. The still ones were the ones who'd had the choice made for them. It was easy in this place to believe that they had been the lucky and fortunate ones. He lowered himself again and drank more water. The vessel was almost empty. That didn't concern him. There was plenty of water that would never be used lying around. The fact that they would never again take a drink of their own water was what concerned him. It should not be that way. That was what he did not want for himself. If he stayed in this place, soon someone would be checking his water container. They would take it with no more thought than he had given when he had taken the water from the man beside him. He did not want to end up like him. He would not allow himself to end up that way. It was wrong to end up like that. The light around him was changing, slowly and subtly, but it was changing. Changing in that way that it does every day at day's end. It would be dark soon. If he could hold out, if he could will himself to exist until dark, he would leave this place and return again never. There should be a gnawing deep inside him for leaving, but there wasn't. When they had trained him, they had talked repeatedly about protecting those on either side of you because those on either side of you were protecting you. He had seen none of that, and neither did he feel any obligation. If everyone would do as he was planning to do, then there would be no need for anyone to be protecting anyone. It was that simple. But if minds wiser than his could not figure that out, then they would stay and die. He was not responsible for all of them. He was only to ensure his own survival. He remembered being told that before leaving home to come here. This was not a place of brotherhood and loyalty as they had said. It was a place of death and he intended on living. He laid himself beside the man beside him and refused to move, even an eyelash while he waited. 2. The men on top of the hill sat rigidly upon their horses. The sun was sinking behind them. He used that scene as his gauge. 
so as long as they didn't move, then he could accurately measure the coming dark. They hadn't moved for nearly two or so hours, and he was betting much on the fact that they would remain as they were for a while yet. When he had started watching the men, they had been merely dark outlines against a bright and intense sun, but now as the sun was sinking, details could be made out. He knew who most of them were. He didn't know them, but he knew who they were. They were the men that he and all those around him were supposed to give their all for, simply because those men had said for them to. Those men had promised to lead them all and deliver unto them victory followed by victory. He looked all about and saw the numbers of the dead and dying exceeding the numbers of those still moving forward. He felt no obligations or allegiances to the men atop their horses. At one time he did, but no longer. They had not handed him a victory as promised. They had led him and so many others into a valley of death. He watched as the sun sank even lower. He knew enough to know that all the blame he wanted to place could not be laid at the feet of those men, but some of it could. And right now, if he knew where even a little of it could be laid, then he would lay what he could and feel better. There was so much fear and anger inside of him that he had to cast at least some of the blame somewhere just to relieve the burden that was weighing on him. When the sun finally sank, he would feel better still. He was readying himself to do what he knew he shouldn't. It was the thing that was despised most by the men that sat on the horses and by the men that were crawling ever forward inch by treacherous inch as well. The shadows were no longer lengthening. They were disappearing. In the falling darkness, a secession was taking place also. Not all, but most of what made all the terrible noise and destruction found it difficult to carry out their assignments in the dark. It was much quieter now because of it. Now the moans and the begging for either help or death could be plainly heard in every direction. It was the knowing that those men were lying out there in the black pleading to die and doing so while all alone that was what cemented his decision to leave this place. The noise had been all but his undoing, but it was these sounds that he could no longer bear to hear. He would brave the absolute quiet if need be, and he would do it willingly if it meant that he never had to hear the agony voiced by so many men again. Darkness continued to fall. Slowly but steadily, it was falling. As far as he knew, his rifle was still in good working order. He had fired it very few times. He had not acted as everyone else. It made the noise that he detested so very much, but he would need it with him if he was going to survive. Killing something to eat was different than what most men on horses atop the hill had intended him to do with it. He had been raised using a rifle, but not in the killing of men, and to his knowledge he had not killed a man since arriving. He wanted to leave before he could no longer say that honestly. It crossed his mind to take the rifle from the man lying beside him as well, but then he remembered that the man's weapon was as broken and useless as its owner. It had been an eight-pound ball fired from a cannon that had been the undoing for both of them. He had heard the ball whistling as it flew through the air. For the briefest of instances, he had seen the ball coming toward them. Maybe there had been time to grab the sleeve of him who had been standing alongside and pull him out of harm's way. Maybe there had been, but he had chosen instead to drop to the ground and cover his head with his arms. He had not seen the ball make contact with the man, but when he had uncovered his eyes, he had seen the aftermath. For nearly two hours, he had lain in what was generously being called a ditch and stared at what was left of the man that he had been talking with earlier. The patch that the man had sewn into his pants to cover a terror was recognizable, but that was the only way he could have told who the man was after the ball had found him. 
He lay there for the longest, thinking about who might be at home, wondering when they might get a letter from him saying that he was still doing well and fighting the good fight. He supposed it might be quite a while before those at home finally gave up hope of ever hearing from him again. Maybe they would resign themselves to thinking that after all the battles he had simply decided to continue his life somewhere else. It would be easier believing that he was alive just in a new place. But down deep, they would know the truth, even if they never allowed themselves to think it. The man's weapon was useless, but he had other things that could be used. Slowly, he went through what was left of the man's pockets and possible bag. Shot and powder were there, as was a knife. He had lost his own somewhere, and he greedily took this new one from the dead man. He did not know the man's name and did not want to. It was easier stealing from just a corpse than it would have been if he had been compelled to grieve for him first. The man had nothing else of use. No one in this field had much of use and hadn't for some time. As they had less each day but were still being told to move forward, the glory and honor they had been promised seemed tarnished and unreachable. It was that along with the noise that made him decide to do as he had. Dying nobly is still dying, and no one knowing who they were pushing into a grave with a hundred other mangled and unknown men was a future he could not willingly allow himself to be a part of. He did not harbor plans for greatness in his mind or heart, but he did intend on living. There was too little chance of that happening if he stayed. Men carrying stretchers were coming in pairs. He could hear them talking. They were searching for the wounded. Most of those that they found would not be alive this time tomorrow, but the effort had to be made out of decency, if for no other reason. Those collecting the dead would come later. He pulled what was left of the man beside him atop his own body and lay very still and barely breathing. He heard them as they neared He listened as they passed by him. He breathed easier when they had walked on. They could not see so well in the darkness. They were searching for men by sound. Too many were everywhere pleading for help for a merciful release. They were concentrating their efforts on getting to those men. The men that would come later could worry about those that no longer made any sounds at all. He intended to leave before that later group arrived. He listened until it was all finally so quiet that night birds could be heard singing their songs. All of those near him that had been pleading for help had been found, or they had died. Either way, they had gone silent, and now he could hear nothing. He looked up and saw that what moon was there was as high as it was going to get that evening, Every minute he waited now was just a minute closer to the eventual sunrise. Now was the time he had been waiting for. He could not afford to wait any longer. He checked to make sure that he had everything he intended to take with him. The list was a short one. He rolled over to his knees and began to crawl in the opposite direction of where sporadic flickers of firelight could be seen in the distance. He crawled quietly, but rapidly. Isn't that what deserters and cowards do? Don't they crawl? He didn't care. Each foot of distance he put between himself and all the horrendous and never-ending wreckage made him feel safer and more in control of his own life than he had felt in so very long. Nettles pierced his palms and he continued to crawl. Rocks broke the flesh of his hands and knees, and he continued to crawl. Where a face had once covered the front of a skull, now there was just a cavity full of cool, soft gel, and because of the darkness into this, he placed one of his hands. And with disgust, he flung the remnants of some poor soul's mind from his fingers and continued to crawl. Only when he left the field and ducked quickly behind a tree did he stand and breathe deeply and slowly. It was dark in the trees, but no voices could be heard and no flickers of firelight were detected. As softly 
but as rapidly as he could, he darted from tree to tree, always stopping with his back against it so he could listen for a moment before continuing on. When the spider leapt from the bark of the tree to the area between the back of his neck and his collar, he stifled a scream and threw the creature as far as he could once his hand had closed around it. He did not think he had been bitten. If he did not fall down sick or begin to swell, then he would know that he had been correct. He moved deeper into the trees. Now that he had made the decision to run away and had taken the first steps toward that end, he wanted to be as far away as quickly as was possible. He had walked and darted from tree to tree and then just darted. Eventually, in spite of the darkness, he began to run. He ran even while the stitch grabbed and burned in his side. He ran with one hand out in front of him to push away vines and limbs and webs. He ran until he was halted by his hand colliding with a tree. He used the same hand to push himself away from the tree and then he continued to run. He ran until there was no more ground beneath his feet and he rolled. The hill had been an impressive one. He had descended it quickly but not without a cost. Now everything hurt. He did not think that anything was broken, but he was sure that everything was bruised and tender. Several times he spat, but the taste of dirt and leaves remained inside his mouth. He was not sure if his rifle had survived the fall intact and wouldn't know until there was again light to see by. He wished he knew now. He would appreciate not worrying all night if it was still usable. And if it wasn't, He would like to have thrown it aside. It was heavy and cumbersome to run with. He spat again and started to run once more in the same general direction that he had been traveling before the tumble. He was scared. Running toward a future that he had no preconceived notions about frightened him. How he was going to survive and where he was to survive was an unknown. Simply running in the dark frightened him trip over a log or step in a hole or run off the edge of a ridge or ledge, and all of his worrying days would soon be over with. Not running fast enough frightened him. He knew what those men on horses would do to him if he didn't run far enough or fast enough. He knew because they had told him, had told all of them. It was bad enough that those wearing the blue coats wanted to kill him simply because he was wearing a gray coat, and the men on the horses with cleaner gray coats would kill him also, just because he had run away from a fight that he did not want to be a part of. He was frightened, but he was no coward. It would have been hard to explain the difference. He wasn't even sure he could make a reasonable or rational separation of the two in his own mind, but there was one. He had known what it was earlier as he had laid among the dead and dying, but he could not recall the right words now as he was running away. He just knew that he had to keep running. That was his only thought. He knew that if he slowed or stopped, they would find him and they would execute him after making an example out of him in front of everyone. They would not be gracious and allow him time to reclaim the difference between running away and cowardice from his memories, even if there was one. 3. When the blackness began to morph into grayness, he feared traveling onward as he had been. The ones that sat on the horses were keen on dispatching and posting snipers, as did those from the opposing view as well or so he had to assume. Running by himself through the forest made him an immediate target for either side. He searched in the ever-lightening woods until he found two fallen trees not so far apart from each other, a wind shear ahead of an oncoming storm sometime in the recent past had toppled the trees, or at least that was his guess. He laid himself between the two and gathered as many leaves and small branches as he could reach to pull over himself like a blanket. He wasn't cold, he just wanted the concealment. He could only hope that he had done an adequate job. 
He would not know if he had until someone passed him by without noticing that he was lying there. As still as those men he had left lying dead in that field miles behind him, he lay. He could see nothing aside from the darkness around him, turning less and less dark. He would not allow himself to move until the black had swallowed everything once again. For how many days he would have to do what he was doing now, he had no idea. Today, he would rely on his hearing instead of his eyes. He would lie and listen for any sound that would indicate that he was no longer alone. It wasn't enough that someone walked near to him without noticing that he was there. What if someone from a distance saw something peculiar and chose to wait and watch? If they were good at what they did, then they might sit still for hours watching the unusual-looking pile of leaves between the two fallen trees just to see if there was more to it than immediately met the eye. Walking up and poking at the pile of leaves with a rifle barrel was a good way to get shot, and the one doing the watching would know this. Instead, he would bide his time and watch. Then if the pile moved wrongly, or if a man emerged from it, then he would put a ball through the until recently concealed man's chest. No, it was too dangerous to try moving at all before night fell again. He'd like to sleep, but he needed to listen. If nothing else, it gave him the time that he needed to think. Not to think about what he should have done. That had already been decided and there wasn't any going back. Now was the time for thinking about what to do next. As far as surviving, the correct decision had been made. At least in his mind it had been correct. Now the decisions concerning living lay ahead of him. It should have been thought through already, but it had not. He had been raised to be a planner. His father had been a tenacious one. From the time as far back as he could remember, his father had all the time been explaining why he was doing a particular something in a particular way. Do this thing in this certain way because it gets you ready to do this other thing six months from now. He had been raised to think about life in those terms, but he had not done any of that during his time of making the decision to run. All he had thought about was getting away. What to do next and where to live and how to live would need to be considered and considered thoughtfully, but as he lay under all those leaves and twigs, a different thought concerned him. The father that he had just been remembering, the father that he was so very proud of, what would he think of the decision that his son had made? He didn't have to wonder. He knew what his father would think. Too many years growing up under the man's roof had taught him to honor his word when he had given it. How many times his father had said something along the lines of, Once you give a man your word about anything, it doesn't matter what it is you keep your word. It matters not how hard you have to work to do it or how much money you lose doing it. If you say that you will do a thing, then you must do the thing. That was why he knew what his father would think if he knew of the decision he had made. It was also why he knew now he could never go home again. Showing up maimed or dead would be preferable to showing up a disgrace. His father had always told him that he would be loved no matter what he did or had done, but his son, being a deserter from a war, had never crossed the man's mind as a possibility. Now he knew that he could never go home again. He simply could not force an honorable man like his father into a lie. His father, saying that he still loved him, even after hearing how he had abandoned the men that he was serving with and fighting alongside, would be a lie. Much better that the man never became aware of what really happened to his son. Allow the old man to live out the rest of his days in dignity. Let him go to his grave believing his son had stood without faltering when the time came for him to stand. Let him never know of how his brave son had hidden beneath corpses and then slunk away in the darkness. The day passed agonizingly slow. He was spent from lying perfectly still and listening with earnest and, as a result, felt completely exhausted. 
more than he had ever been during the forced marches or running from ditch to stump in order to avoid being shot. He supposed that not eating anything for two days had something to do with that, and even though no one had ever made mention of it to him, he was fully aware of how worry and anxiousness can tax the body. Just because he had escaped the battlefield did not mean that he had left his troubles behind him. He had simply traded them for a different batch of new ones. He did not believe that he had veered very far from the direction he had chosen when leaving the battlefield. He didn't know exactly where he was, but he had an idea more or less. He knew that he hadn't traveled as far as he'd like to allow himself to believe that he had. Running for your life in the dark while trying to hear every detectable sound that wasn't native to the deep woods, not to mention working quite hard not to trip and fall over every fallen branch or stumble on every depression in the earth. All of these things exhausted you enough so that it would be easy to convince yourself that you had gone considerably farther than you actually had. He knew where he had been when the fighting started, and he was still in that same place when the running began. Some had called it one thing while others used a different name. It didn't matter. They were one and the same, that dreadful place, and he never wanted to hear either name for it mentioned again. Most of those he had been fighting alongside called the place Sharpsburg while those they were actually fighting called it Antietam. Antietam had been the name of the pretty fair-sized creek that wandered through the hills peacefully. He supposed it still did, but now it was littered with bodies of men from both sides, and the water that had been so clear before now ran red in the aftermath. They had been in Maryland when the fighting began that morning. He was well aware of his proximity to West Virginia. It wasn't so far away from the site of the battle and they had traveled through the state to get to Antietam. He didn't think that he had run so far as to be in West Virginia yet, but was almost positive he would be by dawn tomorrow, assuming he lived through the day. He didn't especially like West Virginia. It was too dark and shadowy for him to warm up to. But he had only seen a narrow portion of the state, and he was being pushed and rushed the whole time at that. He didn't think that he wanted to spend the remainder of his life there, but he would be satisfied for the time being if he could find a place that offered a measure of safety so that he could rest and think about the days and years that lay ahead of him. The more he thought about what all he would need just to survive, the gloomier it seemed. The struggle would be real, and every thought led him to the conclusion that the struggle would be no short amount of time either. The men he had been fighting alongside had been doggedly resilient and almost fanatical in their persistence, and those on the other side, while maybe not quite so enthusiastic about the whole thing, made up for it in numbers that never seemed to lessen. What that told him was that all of this horrible nonsense might not be over with any time soon. As long as it was going on, someone would be looking for him. They had people that did just that one thing. He knew because some of those that sat on the horses had told them so as a way of discouraging actions like he had taken the evening before so it wasn't as if he could just wander into the nearest town, find himself a job and house, and begin the blending in. He had no money to even live on until work started paying up. He had no clothes other than the gray uniform that so many in the country now recognized. A broke drifter in uniform away from his troop and in no hurry to get back was going to stick out like a sore thumb. If he went near a town, it wouldn't be but a short time until the searchers were hot on his trail. He knew that they would be on the lookout for him when he didn't appear in formation, and nobody matching his description could be accounted for. Maybe West Virginia was the best place he could be after all. The darker and more shadowy the better as far as he could tell. For now, anyway. 
It was getting late in the afternoon, and he just knew that if someone even as close as two ridges away listened, they could hear his stomach growling. He had a biscuit in his pocket that he had saved from the day before, if it wasn't crumbled into dust by now. He was sure that he could get it out of his pocket and into his mouth without disturbing the blanket of leaves too very much, but he also wondered if he might need the ration more later on than he did now. His hand closed around a couple of acorns, and using his thumbnail, he managed to remove all of the shell. Glacially slow, he moved his hand until he could drop one of the acorns into his mouth. As he chewed on the grainy but not terribly unpleasant tasting fare, he began the slow process of stripping the second acorn. There is a time that comes each day when the daytime birds and the small animals become quiet and the night creatures begin to stir. He listened as he heard this take place. He knew that it wouldn't be long before he would be able to start running again. He was dreading the night-long adventures of getting slapped in the face with limbs and eating mouthfuls of spider webs and bumping into things. But he was ready to do more than just lie still under a pile of leaves. With the same precise movement that those men in the Orient use when they move one varied grain of sand at a time to create those displays of art, he began to move leaves from his face so that he could observe his surroundings. He needed to be absolutely sure that no one was near enough to notice his leaving. He waited until it was full-on dark, and then forced himself to wait a few moments longer. Perhaps all he was doing was too much, but he knew that he would never feel safe about moving if he didn't take every precaution. He would need to be always looking forward. There was no time for looking over his shoulders and wondering if he had missed something. Only after he was as sure as he thought he could be, that no one was in the neighborhood watching him, only then did he rise himself from the tomb of leaves and branches to stand very still and listen before proceeding. South was all he had ever known, so that was the direction he started in. 4. Sometimes there were rocky overhangs to be found and crawl up under, and twice there had been catastrophic deadfalls of trees to weave his way inside for protection. But mostly, each day during those first ten or so days, he did each day as he had done the first day. He lay motionless under whatever he could gather to cover himself until darkness came once again. Reuben Miller was beginning to wonder if there would ever again be a day when he could sit with a full belly and take his ease without worrying if someone was watching him from the shadows. It was beginning to feel as if there wouldn't be. The near-constant running and near-constant fasting had begun to show on his frame, but he had been lucky and had been able to run across solitary farmsteads every couple of three days. It was wartime and no one had much of anything, much less plenty to spare but he had taken from the smokehouses and root cellars only that which would keep him alive instead of all that he wanted. Reuben hated that he had been forced into thievery, but he would not allow greed and selfishness to be heaped among the misdoings. What he was going through now was of his own making, and he could not allow others to support it. He was thinking about that very thing when he felt himself begin to fall. He had not become entangled in anything, nor had he tripped over something. The ground was simply no longer beneath him, and he began to fall. Quickly, roughly, and in near complete darkness, he fell. Outside it had been dark as he had run and then fell. Now as he lay there, there was nothing but blackness. Everything hurt, but he lay very still, taking mental stock of himself and evaluating his condition. He could not see, but as near as he could tell, nothing was broken or cut severely. He was aware that there were some scrapes and minor lacerations, but nothing to be concerned about, he didn't think. Well, that was fortunate. 
He had no way to address a major injury and couldn't see to do it if he'd received one. That didn't mean that he wasn't going to hurt for a few days, though. The fall into this place had not been on clean, sandy ground. It had been over rock-strewn ways and they had done damage as he had fallen. He held his breath as he forced his eyes to take in every ounce of light that was available. A faint lightning revealed how he had entered this place. It was still much too dark to know any details about where he was, but he could at least tell that his fall had seemed much longer than it actually was. The opening that he had fallen through was not directly above him, and for that he was grateful. The fact that he had fallen down an incline as compared to falling straight down a hole probably meant that the way out would be easier than it could have been. He started to force himself to sit up, but numerous points of injured soft tissue screamed in outrage at him. He lay back down and reminded himself that he had been nowhere in the past 12 days where he had been so safe from discovery as he was now. Likely, he would have been forced to lay still for a day or so to recover from the fall, but now he lay with a contented smile on his face as it dawned on him that he need not bother with running again until he wanted to. He would not be found in this place. He slept soundly for the first time since deserting. As Reuben Miller snored softly and his dreamless sleep began to restore him, he had no idea what finding this place was actually going to mean for him. Not entirely sure if he had been feeling the growling in his stomach that had awakened him, or the sound of the growling that had, but one of them had. They were both symptoms of the same affliction that needed remedy. Hungry as he was, though, he still smiled. He had expected to wake being sore as a rising, but his first thoughts had been of eating, and that told him that he likely wasn't going to experience the pain he had been preparing himself for. He sat up and winced. He was definitely sore and stove up, but only at a tolerable level, especially considering how he had entered this place. The sun was up a while already, and he could make out more of his surroundings now. Where he was at wasn't spacious enough to be considered a cavern, but it was much more than just a hole. It wasn't a cave either, or at least not one like he had ever heard about. It wasn't a room, but that was how he saw the place and would refer to it often as that. The room was almost round or circular in shape with some sort of gritty covering along with the rocks on the floor. The walls were almost black everywhere that he could see. Not black because of the darkness, but black because the room was not a hollow inside of a rock formation. Black because the walls were made of coal. He walked all around the edges. It took 29 steps to travel at all. He ran his hand across the surface of the wall and thought to himself that until he knew what he should do, this place offered security from the weather as well as those who might be looking for him. It was well concealed but had plenty of fresh air available, not to mention there was a nearly inexhaustible source of fuel for heat and for cooking. Now all he needed was a water source and some food. His stomach was still growling, but he laid down once he had used the toe of his shoe to kick some of the larger stones away, and he felt safer than at any time over the past nearly two weeks. He wanted to sleep and didn't care if he didn't wake until this time tomorrow. He was up before the sun was, and even though he felt safe and secure in this new place, he made a point of not abandoning the measures of caution he had adopted since deciding to leave the war behind him. With calculated motions, he emerged from the coal mine and stood outside listening. The sky was just beginning to lighten, and he had to stare for long moments at things to be sure what he was seeing. But aggravating as that was, it was still smarter than just walking around in broad daylight. He heard nothing unusual, and in truth he had not expected to hear anything out of the way, but he had to make sure. Food was a priority, but water was a must. 
It had been more than 24 hours since he had had a drink and he was feeling the effects. Reuben was still thinking clearly, but he could feel hazy walls closing in, and he supposed it would be partly due to the tumble he had taken into the coal shaft, but it didn't feel like an injury-related effect. It felt like if he could just have a cool drink, he would feel completely himself again. And he stumbled as he tried to turn, but kept his balance and continued in his search. Unless he just happened up on a spring, the chances of him finding water up on this ridge were almost nil. The coal shaft was ideally located for his purposes. It gave him a clear view of everything around him aside from directly behind him, The opening was overgrown, and unless you knew to look for it, the eyes would never see it. But so far, it didn't seem as if water was close to hand, and that was a problem. He had his canteen as well as the one he had taken from the dead soldier that had fallen beside him, so if he found water, he could carry it back with him. But if the water ended up being too far away, he would have to evaluate whether the effort was worth it. He guessed that it would have been too much to ask for the perfect place to hide to also have a water supply. Nothing is ever perfect in this world, he thought to himself as he walked. Reuben walked slowly and methodically for two hours, stopping every few feet to listen for any sounds of running water. The more he tried to hear any, the thirstier he found himself becoming. He couldn't understand how everything could be so thick and lush and green without adequate water nearby. Maybe it was because of the shape of the land. The coal shaft and everywhere he had been walking was on sidling ground. It was all part of a high hardwood ridge that he had been skirting back and forth. And maybe all the foliage took its moisture from the rainfall that slowly bled its way down the ridge and dispersed itself evenly among every bush and tree. Maybe there wasn't any water to be found. He was becoming dizzier with each step and was about to sit down in the hope that some rest would help clear his head when he saw the movement from the corner of his eye. He jerked his head in that direction and studied the landscape for any sign of something moving. He was beginning to think he had imagined it all when farther away he finally saw a pair of raccoons chasing each other. They scampered as if they were enjoying themselves, just having the best times playing with each other. He followed them and refused to allow the pair to escape his sight. He knew that where there were cones, there was water. They didn't stray too far from it. If he kept his eyes on them, then eventually they would lead him to it. Patiently, he followed them while they chattered and rustled. Twice he stopped, leaning his head against a tree until the world stopped spinning. Then he continued on, while all the while he kept as precise a track as he could of where he was in relation to the coal shaft. Until he discovered that it simply wasn't logical or practical, he would continue to consider the coal shaft as the center from which he would function. The two raccoons looked up and stared at him as he laughed out loud. The sound startled them, but they apparently didn't see him as a threat. They continued swishing their front paws in the cool water while Reuben sat on the ground chuckling. The raccoons had led him on a merry and quite exhaustive march through the woods, only to land him less than a couple of hundred yards from where he had crawled out of the shaft. There was no corner to the ridge, but if there had been, then just around the left one, and just down the way lay the pool of water. Fed by a narrow creek and emptying into a much more narrow one, the pool was neither wide nor deep, but it was full of clear, fresh water. The raccoons barked before scurrying away as he approached. They sat and watched as he fell to his knees and lapped at the water. They tilted their heads as he thanked them for showing him the way. It was the first time that he had heard the sound of his own voice in nearly two weeks. He told himself that though he must remain cautious and vigilant, he must remember to speak on occasion, lest he fall deeper and deeper into that place of isolation from which there may not be any way to escape from once fully there. It was bad enough that he must be physically isolated. 
to be mentally isolated from the world was worse. It would be easy to just stop speaking as he went about his life, do all that was required of him so that he could stay alive, and do it in silence would be an easy trap to fall into. But he could not allow himself to do that. He would not allow himself to do that. Just to be alive had cost him too much already, maybe even his soul. Absolutely, it had already cost him his pride, his honor, and his dignity, not to mention his family and the honor that came with the name as part of his birthright. He would not permit his sanity to be lost as well. It was something that he would have to always be on guard against, but there would always be the concern that insanity could sneak up on him and know his every move as easily as he had sneaked up on the raccoons. 5. There were several meals of roasted frog legs and several failed attempts before he finally figured out how to make a snare function properly. Now, though, he was eating more or less regularly and had been for some time. At some point, every day the pool was visited by a wide variety of small animals, and he caught something for his supper almost every time he laid a trap. Often, deer came, and he knew this because he watched them come and go. But because he had damaged his rifle during the initial fall into the shaft, there was little he could do about the larger animals other than watch them drink and then leave. He had been living in the shaft for more than a month. While he couldn't honestly say that the days were pleasant, they had fallen into a routine that he found acceptable. The stock of small game that came continually to the pool somehow managed to keep replenishing itself so there were very few days when he went without something to eat. In the hands of a gunsmith, his rifle could have been made functional again with a little bother, but since that was very much out of the question, he put it to use in a different but just as beneficial way. It bothered him to do it, but crashing the weapon against the wall so that he could dislodge the barrel from the stock was the only way he could get the heavy barrel loose. Starting the first fire had not been accomplished easily, but once it had been burning, he discovered that living in a room made of coal did not mean that fuel for the fire was always ready at hand. He needed a way to chip the coal from the wall, and the knife he had was too useful to take a chance of chipping or breaking it by using it as a chisel. With a hard stone from the pool, he pounded the steel barrel against the coal wall until pieces for him to burn broke free. It didn't take many sessions of doing this before he learned how to read the grain lines and veins in the coal. Chipping it away from the wall became easier once this had been learned. After that, he refused to allow the fire to go out. There wasn't any reason for him to let that happen. There was abundant fuel, and it had been too hard to get started in the first place. Now, even if it was a small one, a fire was all the time burning in his new home. Now he sat there, sat there looking into the fire. His legs were crisscrossed and his back was against the section of log that he had slid into the shaft for just this purpose. He had grown tired of wanting to sit near to the fire but having nothing to support his back while he did. Maybe he would start giving some consideration to trying to fashion a piece or two of usable furniture. He didn't know how he would accomplish that, having no tools and no experience, but he would think about it some. He could use the furniture, but if nothing else, then the thinking of how to construct it would fill several hours. This is what he mainly did now. Reuben looked for ways to fill the endless hours. Then he slept and awoke to begin again. Maybe he would think about the furniture tomorrow. He had already decided earlier to spend today thinking about what he was missing out on the most by living the way that he was. It was a dangerous thing to do, and he was well aware of it. A couple of times already, he had allowed his mind to drift away to the life that could never be, and the mood it had left him with had not left him as easily as the tender thoughts that had played out in his mind. There was his father, of course. 
Not that he had grown tired of remembering his father, just that he had thought extensively about all that he was doing was as much for the man as it was for himself. That sounded as if he were trying to make himself out to be charitable and giving. That was a direct falsehood, and he would not allow himself to delude himself in that way. Bastardizing his reasons for living as he was into something other than his fear of being caught was a road that led to nowhere. Yes, he'd had his father in mind when he had found the place and decided to stay. He would not be the cause of any shame to be rained on the man or the family name, but fool no one, he was staying out of cowardice. Afraid of what they would do to him if they caught him, and how the ridicule would pain inwardly while their punishments pained outwardly. The physical would be brief, for he was sure that he would be put to death, but it would still hurt. Of that he was certain. But he had thought about all of this until he was tired of thinking about it. He was safe and secure here, as far as he knew, and likely his father was grieving a son who had died with dignity, but was buried in a mass grave somewhere. It was time to allow his mind to linger elsewhere for a time. Often he chided himself when he caught himself wishing for things that could never be. It was a fruitless way to waste time that only led him into darkness that was sometimes very hard to escape from. Were he still back in the real world, then if he had a wish that stayed with him until it became a goal then he could do something about it. He might try and subsequently fail, might even try numerous times with no better luck, but out there at least he could try. In this place where he had chosen to hide himself away from everyone and everything, he could do nothing to help a wish come to pass. So it was better not even to think along those lines. He had found this out in what some might call the hard way, Still, there was that one thing that was impossible to think about or even remember without wishes tagging along, so he allowed them to without protestations. She was strong, but so very delicate. She was a well of opinions that never seemed to dry up, but she always wanted to hear your thoughts first about everything. She was elegant, even when there was an acre of dirt under her fingernails from where she had been planting flowers or vegetables all day. She was soft-spoken, but she could cut your throat with her words if she chose to. Never once had he ever heard her say anything in an attempt to be hurtful, but her words carried emotion and passions that fell on you resolutely and with impact. She was the woman he had wanted to marry the only woman he had ever wanted to marry, and she was the woman who wanted to be married to him. She was the only daughter of a moderately successful tobacco and pecan farmer, and her name was Starry, Starry Henderson. Although Mr. Henderson had done reasonably well for himself and his family, he wasn't wealthy by any measure. Every member of the family had been expected to pitch in And Starry was not exempt simply because she was born a woman. She had grown up working alongside her two brothers and could hold her end of any detail. She wasn't an anomaly. Most women around the area where Reuben was from had grown up as Starry had. As girls and young women, they had done their part just as she had, but Starry was different from all the others that Reuben had ever known. At least she was to him. There was something that up until now had been unidentifiable about her, something that raised her above all the others he had ever known. He was well aware that his being in love with her caused him to see her differently than he saw everyone else. He had fallen head over heels for her the first time he had seen her, and she was only eleven at that time. But even his twelve-year-old mind knew that she was special, at least to him she was. At 19, he knew that he wanted to spend every day of his life with her, and he told her plainly. It came as a relief and a little bit of a surprise to hear that she felt the exact same way about him. But then the war came along and his feelings became muddled between wanting to never ever leave her side and doing what he believed at the time that he should. 
That one decision had changed everything, and now there was no going back to repair the damage. The war that was still raging somewhere without him had completely altered his life. He supposed that a great many would be able to make the same statement, but not for the same reason. But if there was a positive in any of this for him, it was that he now had the time to think about and understand those qualities that made Starry so different from everyone else. Forever he had known that they existed, and now he would know what they were, even if he was never again to experience them firsthand. Though he would undoubtedly absolutely never again know the touch of her hand or the sound of her voice upon his ear, it was important to have clear in his mind why she had left her mark carved so deeply on him. Perhaps more important now than if he was right beside her for the remainder of his life. It would be one thing to be there and to appreciate her. But to be displaced from her, it was necessary for him to know what it was about her that caused him to miss her so. He missed his family. He missed the life he once had. He missed those he thought of as friends, but there wasn't a word that he knew of that told how he felt about being apart from her. He needed to know what it was about her that made him feel that way. He supposed poets, since the invent of the written word, had been trying to capture these things with ink and parchment, but they didn't have the time to focus on it that he now had. He afforded himself a drink of water from the canteen and sat back against the piece of log, and he closed his eyes. Closing them didn't help him see her better. It allowed him to see himself better. He saw the conversations they'd had when he was a better man in a better place, and with his eyes open, he could still hear her words and see her face. But he saw her in this place where he was no longer the man that he had tried to be for her. When he closed his eyes, he was standing beneath those large trees that grew near to the pool of water not far from where she lived. They often met there and sat in the cool of the shade and watched the water as they talked. They had stayed too long during one of those conversations. It was on a Thursday. They had known it was getting late. How could you not know when you were outdoors and the light fading by the minute? Yet they stayed and watched as they talked. The light began as a thin golden ribbon outlining a part of the opposite bank of the pool. And quickly, it grew until the small pool seemed to be filled with a reflection of the moon. For some reason, the image in the water was more appealing to stare at than the real thing. The moon above was hanging as it does on occasion so clearly and so golden brightly that it seemed as if you could walk to the top of the nearest hill and just reach out and touch it. But the one in the water was the one that they could see, the one that only they could see. For a time, the moon and its light belonged only to them, and he didn't know if she felt the same way about what was in front of them. He hadn't mentioned his thoughts. It wasn't the type of thing that men are supposed to say, he didn't think. The following morning, he had stepped outside to begin his work for the day, and he found a note addressed to him affixed to one of the porch posts. It said that all night long she had thought of sitting beside that pool forever with her head on his shoulder. She wanted to spend the rest of her life hearing him say that he loved her while they watched their moon. He had carried that note and one other inside his uniform for the longest. He read each one daily but nine straight days of rain had eventually destroyed them. The rain destroyed the only words he had of hers. The war had destroyed everything else. She hadn't wanted him to go away. It wasn't that she disapproved of his decision. It was just his being gone that she disapproved of. She had promised to wait for him, but he guessed that she had changed her thinking by now about that. She was smart, Starry was. She would realize how fruitless it was waiting for someone that would never return. Perhaps she had grieved, though, for a time. It was as much as he could have expected from her or ask of her considering what he had done.
Thank you for listening to this episode of Stagecoach, brought to you by Dusty Saddles Publishing, the home of Western excellence where the best of the Western authors can be found. Visit our website at dspublishingnetwork.com. Please join us for our next episode as we continue with Honored Friend and Hero by Jeff Crawford.